And he hands him to Suzette, and he says, I promise I will never knock your house down. Because I've never went through something like that. And she brings him in the house, and this tells you something about her character, and I got this from him. He said she put her arms around me, and I put mine around her, and she offered me a cup of coffee, and that's when we became friends. I mean, Little Pink House, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but it is a terrific human account, and I don't say that because I wrote it. Uh, th this is about the people and what they did. Uh, the Institute for Justice took this case because it was a no hope situation for these people. And they won their case in trial in New London. This case goes to trial and they win. A case that thought could not be won. And then it was appealed to the Connecticut Supreme Court. It was reversed by one vote. And then it went all the way to the US Supreme Court. And of course, nobody could believe. After Sandra Day O'Connor asked this critical question to Wesley Horton, the, the lawyer who represented the city in the Supreme Court, she was asked, he, she asked him a very simple question. And it was, if there was a Motel 6 and Ritz Carlton came along and said they wanted to build their hotel where Motel 6 is, can the city take Motel 6's property away and give it to the Ritz Carlton? Why, yes. The quick response. Why was it so quick? Well, because they'd rehearsed this question. Because this was the one question that the lawyers for the city, when they did their mock trials at Georgetown and, these, and Yale and these other law schools getting ready for this hearing, this was the question that tripped them every time. When the judges would ask them that question, the first time they said, well, no, of course not. I mean, that sounds adulterous. It's hideous. No. And then when they conferenced after, the, guy, the other lawyer says, yeah, but if you say no to that, we can't, we can't justify what we're doing here. I mean, it, this doesn't work. Because then the next question is going to be, well, then where do you draw the line? And he said, the other guy says, well, the only way to answer that is you just got to say yes. And then move on, or else we're going to spend 30 minutes of oral argument fighting about that question. So as soon as O'Connor asked it, Horton answered it. And as soon as Horton answered it, Scott Bullock, the lawyer for the Institute for Justice, thought, we won. <laughs> I mean, if that's the argument, well, there's no way we can lose. This is unbelievable. And in fact, Scalia was sitting there, and he said, um, let me get this straight. Are, are you saying, this simple, you look at the transcript. If you, are you saying you can take from A and give to B if B can pay more taxes than A? And Horton said, well, if it's considerably more taxes, yes. <laughs> and Scalia said, okay, meaning not that I accept that, but I think I understand where you're going. Now we can move on. And that's where they lost O'Connor. O'Connor had written the previous eminent domain opinion that everybody thought she'd be on the side of the city in this case. She flipped, and she ended up writing the dissent, which has carried the day. It is, it is a far more memorable opinion than the majority opinion. It's the thing that everybody remembers. And it's the last thing she wrote before she retired. She went out with a bang. And the homeowners lose. And a year later, they're still in our homes. And I'll end with this, because I thought it was profound. A year after this, you're still in your home. And the governor, new governor, because the governor who was behind this plan is in prison. <laughs> and so he's in prison. His chief of staff is in prison. Claire, the president of all this, has been unbelievably fired from Connecticut College because over 70% of the tenured faculty circulate a petition demanding that she be fired. And the president of Pfizer is no longer with Pfizer. So the four pillars of power who brought this thing to bear are gone. The only one left standing is the divorced nurse in the little pink house. And the new governor dispatches an emissary down there and says, you have an open checkbook. Get these people out of their homes without a public mess. And all the other people have now taken the money and run except her. And the governor has now issued an ultimatum through the emissary, and the ultimatum is this. The money is on the table until midnight tonight. And after tonight, the money's off the table, 
and you are left to your own devices with the city of New London, be that as it may. So Fox News and Sean Hannity send a truck down there, and they put Suzette on national television that night at about 9 o'clock Eastern time, three hours before the deadline. I'm there because I'm reporting now. I'm writing the story now. So I'm in the background watching. And Sean Hannity asks her, you know, Ms. Kilo, what are you going to do at midnight? And her answer is the same as it's always been. I want to I stay in my house. Well, we'll be watching, Ms. Kilo. And then, boom, the interview's over. Lights go off, go on to the next story. They take the lights down. The guys who are operating the local truck, they're taking all their equipment down. They walk to Suzette to take her microphone off. And they shake her hand. And they say, Ms. Kilo, we're with you. We're with you. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, no, you're not. No, you're not. That's like the guy who's you know, six rows back in the Army who's sending bullets up to the guy in the front, saying, keep firing. We're with you. You're not with her. And so they get in the truck, and they drive off. And now there's nobody there, and it's dark as dark can be. It's a foggy, humid New England night. And here she is standing out in front of this pink house by herself, but for a reporter. And, and I walk her to the door of her house. She goes up the steps, and she stops, and she turns around, and she says, Jeff, um, what do you think I should do? And I said, uh, I don't know if there's any journalists in the room. I said, um, you know, Suzette, I can't, I can't answer that because I'm here to write what you do and watch and observe. Um, it's not my place to advise. And she said, yeah, but what do you think I should do? And you get to know Suzette. Suzette didn't hang around for eight years because she's not persistent. And uh, I said, well, Suzette, um, I'm not going to tell you what I think you should do. But I'll tell you what I think. And what I think is, the governor doesn't have the backbone or the stomach to watch you get dragged out of your house by marshals as cameras roll from the NBC Nightly News and Fox and ABC and the New York Times and everybody else. She doesn't have the stomach for that. And if push comes to shove, that won't happen. I think if you want to stay in your house, you can stay here until you die. If you wake up tomorrow and decide you're not going, I don't think you're going. But the other thing, I think, is you look around. Everything you wanted is gone. These neighbors, these people who became like family to you after you lost your family, they're not here anymore. And in a few weeks, those houses are going to be piles of dirt. But the question is, you know, do you want to stay? And then I went home, said goodnight to my kids, and I tucked myself in my very comfortable bed in my nice home in the next town over that doesn't have a problem with eminent domain. And then I got up in the morning, and I called Suzette. And I said, what are you doing? And that was the day they struck the deal that was handled by the Institute for Justice. It saved the pink house. It was the only house in 90 acres that was saved from the wrecking ball. It's the only one standing today it's in another part of town. It was taken down board by board and reconstructed board by board. In another part of New London, it's now a public landmark that anybody can go to. Uh, she doesn't live there anymore. She lives uh, in Groton, across the, the way. Um, she received, I think, a good sum of money, which she used to buy a house that was similar to the one she had. And she became the poster child for eminent domain. And she's gone all over the country talking about it. Um, it was a privilege and an honor to write about her and everybody else in the story, including Claire and the people on the other side. I found them fascinating, compelling. Um, it was a terrific story. And it's made a huge impact on public policy and eminent domain in every state in the country. Um, I thank you. And I'd be happy to take a couple of questions. Um, do you think that there'll be another case in front of the U.S. Supreme Court on eminent domain? Well, I mean, eventually there could be, I guess. Uh, they don't take a lot of eminent domain cases. And look, I'll tell you right now, there's probably people in this room who are much more scholarly about the Supreme Court than I am. I don't profess to be.